the cold-blooded follower of Jack the Ripper, who left no clues and made no mistakes, was wanted for more than 50 years. Many believed the killer had ties to high society or was himself in the police force. Now there is a new version, forcing Scotland Yard to think about reopening the investigation. Lenta Rue traced the history of the famous maniac. Hannah Tailford. On February 2, 1964, at Hammersmith Bridge over the Thames, the remains of a 30-year-old woman were found. The killer had stripped her naked, leaving only her stockings untouched, and gagged her with her underwear. She was also missing several teeth. The body belonged to a London prostitute, Hannah Tailford. A few years before the murder, she was involved in a scandal that ruined the career of British War Minister John Profumo. He was forced to resign after being accused of participating in orgies and having affairs with girls of easy virtue. Profumo's case documents were classified until 2113, rumored to be because of dirt on members of the royal family. Wealthy and influential people were many of Hannah's clients. She was often invited to orgies in aristocratic houses and was always well paid for the work. Once the girl was put in a luxury limousine and brought to a high society party. There she was offered in public to have sex with a man in a gorilla suit. She agreed and received for her labor 25 pounds sterling. Today, this amount corresponds to 500 pounds sterling, or 40,000 rubles. Most often, Hannah spent time in a coffee shop near Trafalgar Square, where people who made amateur pornographic films looked in. Such filming was another source of income for the prostitute. She was last seen there on January 24th. Detectives interviewed several hundred people who might have known something, but all to no avail. As the investigation stalled, another murdered prostitute was found in the Thames. Irene Lockwood was a prostitute in the London suburb of Chiswick. Journalist David Seabrook, who wrote a book about the investigation into the case, calls her an experienced blackmailer. She would bring men into the apartment, undress them in the hallway, and lock herself in the bedroom with them. Her accomplices would then scrutinize the contents of the client's pockets. In addition to valuables, Irene was interested in secrets that could be used for blackmail and extortion. Her naked body was found in the Thames on February 8, 1964. The police immediately noticed the traits that Lockwood and Tailford had in common. The murdered worked as prostitutes, suffered from venereal diseases, and were pregnant. Both were short in stature, 152 and 157 centimeters. And most unusually, both were naked. Usually, prostitutes did not take off all their clothes, but only pulled up their skirts. The conclusion was that there was a maniac in London. The police believed that he undresses his victims after the murder and then takes the naked bodies to the river and throws them into the water. The tabloid press immediately dubbed him Jack the Undresser by analogy with Jack the Ripper, who killed London prostitutes in the 99th century. During the search in the apartment, Irene Lockwood found a business card of 57-year-old tennis court guard Kenneth Archibald. So, in the case appeared the first suspect. At first, the man denied knowing the murdered woman but then he turned up at the police station to confess. I lost my temper and grabbed her by the throat, he explained. When I strangled her, I took off her clothes and pushed her into the river. I took the clothes home and burned them. The guard's story would have been more convincing if a third strangled prostitute had not been found by then. There was no way Archibald could have killed her, but the case went to trial anyway. At the trial, the man changed his testimony again. Now he claimed that he was not guilty of anything and his confession was written off as a weak psyche and alcoholism. Since the prosecution was based only on his words, he was acquitted. Patrolling the streets, doubled forces were thrown, detectives interviewed thousands of people and recorded the license plate numbers of cars passing in the evening and at night in the places where the bodies were found. Police officers caught the maniac on the prowl, walking the streets of London in provocative clothing. Frightened prostitutes tried to stick together and memorized each other's clients. There were rumors that someone was deliberately trying to compromise the London police. On July 24th, a fourth naked corpse was found on a street in Chiswick. A fifth murdered girl was discovered on a quiet street in Kensington on November 25th. Like Hannah Tailford, she had been implicated in the scandal surrounding War Minister John Profumo. Her friend saw the girl get into her client's Ford Zodiac, got a good look at his face, and helped her put together a sketch. The suspect turned out to be a man of sturdy build, with a round face. 
Another important piece of evidence was traces of car paint, which were found on the bodies of the three victims of the maniac. Scotland Yard noticed that a familiar pattern was also evident in old unsolved murders. On June 7, 1959, a girl named Elizabeth Figg was found strangled on the banks of the Thames in Chiswick. Another murdered was 22-year-old Gwyneth Rees, who had come to London from South Wales. Her body was found in the same place on November 8, 1963. Her pimp was under suspicion, but he had an iron-clad alibi. On February 16, 1965, the body of a fifth victim was found in an industrial area of Ecton. After that, the protracted investigation was headed by an experienced detective, John Du Rose. For the speed with which he solved crimes, his colleagues nicknamed him Johnny Four Days. Under his leadership, the police combed 38 square kilometers in the vicinity of the industrial zone and found a transformer box, which the killer used as a hiding place. At the same time, John Du Rose intensified the psychological pressure on the criminal. He organized a survey of thousands of people who worked in the industrial zone and publicly stated that he already had suspects, and they were only three. The detective hoped that the frightened maniac would give himself away. That didn't happen. But the killing stopped. Finding new evidence failed, so the identity of Jack the Stripper remained a mystery. Was the killer connected to the upper classes of English society? Was he involved in the Profumo case? Did the killer pull out the teeth of his victims? If so, why not all of them? What role did their venereal diseases play in the choice of victims? There were no answers to these questions. In 1970, John Du Rose, by then retired, gave an interview to the BBC and said that the investigation had identified the perpetrator as early as 1965. The police were ready to arrest him, but did not have time. He killed himself. In fact, we got what we wanted, Du Rose said. He was scared enough to take his own life. In 1974, Brian McConnell, in Found Naked and Dead, described the man Du Rose was alluding to. In his version, he was a 40-year-old World War II veteran nicknamed Big John. It was in the war that he first paid for sex. In peacetime, Big John was a police officer. When he was fired for drunkenness, he became angry and took revenge on his co-workers by committing perfect murders that were impossible to solve. He worked in an industrial zone in Ecton and had access to a transformer box where the killer hid the victim's bodies. For several years, this version was considered the only plausible, but not everyone believed in it. Journalists joined the investigation, picking apart all the arguments of the police. In 1972, Owen Summers published an article in the Sun newspaper, destroying the official theory. According to him, Big John could not have committed one of the murders, as he was leaving London. 35 years later, journalist David Seabrook got unrestricted access to all the investigation materials and wrote a new book about Jack the Stripper. He discovered that a Scotsman named Mungo Ireland was hiding under the name Big John and confirmed Summer's information. Ireland did have an alibi, and he'd only been working in that industrial estate for three weeks. Before his suicide, Ireland wrote to his wife, I can't stand it. Maybe it's my fault, but not entirely. I am sorry Harry is a burden to you. Tell the boy I love him. Goodbye, Jock, P.S. So you and the police don't waste time looking. I'll be in the garage. Journalist Johnny Sharp explains the police mention by saying that Ireland was being searched for minor traffic offenses. The rest is due to the difficulties the deceased was having with his wife, which is also corroborated by her words. The murders had nothing to do with it. Continuing to criticize Du Rose's version, David Seabrook writes that many of those involved in the investigation did not believe the chief, but could not openly oppose him. William Baldock, one of the detectives searching for Jack the Stripper, suspected another ex-cop. Ten years before the murders began, he had been convicted of petty theft and scandalously dismissed from the police force. In retaliation, he decided to compromise his former colleagues by planting them with high-profile and unsolvable cases. Seabrook supports Baldock by assuring readers that the killer deliberately committed crimes in areas under the jurisdiction of five police departments, thus creating even more problems for investigators. When the suspect was a police officer, it was in these five areas that he worked. In 1965, the precinct boundaries were changed, and he lost his motivation. That's why the killing stopped. In 2006, Stuart Holm publishes an article in which he describes his journey in investigating the Hammersmith murders. According to him, 
he met David Seabrook in person and learned that his suspect was still alive. Holm used information from Seabrook's book and found a former London police officer, Andrew John Cashway, whom Seabrook and Baldock believed to be Jack the Riddler. In addition, Holm discovered that Seabrook had been silent on another promising theory that a high-ranking police officer, Tommy Butler, could have been the killer. In 2001, journalist Jimmy Tippett Jr. found out that in the criminal environment of Jack the Undresser, crimes were attributed to the British heavyweight boxing champion, Freddie Mills, who was known as a pervert and liked to hurt women. The life of the famed athlete ended shortly after the last murder. In July 1965, he committed suicide. Wilson's Theory In 2019, criminologist David Wilson from the University of Birmingham proposed a version, after which Scotland Yard thought about reopening the investigation. He managed to link the crimes of Jack the Undresser with two murders committed in the early 20th century. In Wilson's opinion, the maniac was Harold Jones from the town of Abertillery. At the age of 15, Jones murdered an eight-year-old girl, but due to a lack of evidence, he was acquitted. Two weeks after the trial, he took the life of another girl and hid her body in the attic of his parents' house. He confessed to this crime himself and went to jail. In 1941, he was released and sent to the front. About his further fate, almost nothing is known. According to Wilson, he lived in North London under the name of Harold Stevens and worked in the same industrial zone where the cache of the killer. He died of cancer in 1971. In mid-February, Wilson talked about his findings in the documentary Dark Sun, The Hunt for the Serial Killer. He assures that he has provided the police with evidence that they never had before. Perhaps they will help put an end to the Jack the Stripper case.